Now, let's look at a few insects that I know you have seen before, the Odonata. So, Odonata, commonly known as dragonflies and damselflies. Uh, the name is from the Greek word odonto, meaning tooth. So any of you who have read up anything on, oh, people who study teeth or forensics or what, whatever, if you think of an odontologist, that's somebody who studies teeth. So this odonto um, refers to the really strong teeth that are found in the mandibles of the adults. These are really large winged insects. Uh, they're often covered in just bright colors on both the wings and on the abdomen. This makes them very popular. I mean, anything that looks pretty like this, right? Super, super popular. So they're the effort of, the, uh, um, of many conservation efforts in North America, in Europe, and in Asia. The group overall ranges from about 2 to 15 centimeters in size, uh, and they have a really mobile head that can be twisted really far to either side. On the uh, apex of that head, they have these short, cetaceous antennae. Now, the head has large compound eyes. These eyes ha have up to 35,000 omatidia. Remember those omatidia that are those... Um, cells in those compound eyes. This makes these eyes the largest found among the insects. They also have mandibulate mouth parts, and these mouth parts are extremely strong. They allow for attacking heavily sclerotized insects. The prothorax is really tiny, while the meso and the metathorax um, is, are both large and powerful and kind of fused together. So you sort of see an indentation or a dip down where the prothoracic region is. Look right up here. So you got those meso and the metathoracic regions where the wings are attacked, little tiny, um, smaller uh, prothorax there. Hey. <clears throat> So the meso and the metathorax are covered with several small mobile sclerites or plates, each with their own grouping of muscles. So this allows for the movement of these very powerful wings. Now the legs, the legs are shaped like grasping tools and they're pointed slightly forward underneath the head. These work really well for grabbing prey in midair and holding it while eating but they don't work well for things like walking or running. So these are primarily flying insects that use their legs to grab prey. Now the abdomen is very long and narrow and the sternal regions of the second and the third abdominal segments are modified in males. They sport these secondary copulation organs that allow for mating in flight. The order as a whole exhibits hemimetabolous metamorphosis, so the young are called naiads, and they live in water using gills to extract oxygen. The naiads are found primarily in freshwater environments where they're predatory, feeding on smaller and slower prey. Now, we break up this order into two suborders, the dragonflies and the damselflies. Your assigned reading this week will go a little bit more in depth into the names of these orders. I'm just going to call them dragonflies versus damselflies. So, the dragonflies. These are easily recognizable. Uh, they're these large insects. They fly around water. And here on campus, you can see these bright red, bright blue dragonflies sort of darting around puddles in the grass, especially after it rains. Dragonflies in general have a very robust body structure. This is going to support the musculature that propels their huge wings. So they have these two really large pair of membranous wings. The wings are of similar size and shape, although the hind wing is often larger or wider than the forewing there. The wings have obvious venation throughout and this elaborate vein pattern allows the wings to resist the enormous pressure that happens when you when they try to fly with these particular uh, format or these particular types of wings now the dragonfly is going to hold its wings horizontally at rest so when you see a dragonfly sitting somewhere it's going to have its wings sitting straight out this makes it very easy to tell a dragonfly from a damselfly even from far far away 
When flying, the dragonfly is going to beat its wings asynchronously, meaning that each wing moves independently. This allows the dragonfly to avoid any air turbulence that might happen when the, if the wings uh, would be moving together, kind of like in a butterfly. So the odonata are really the only flying insects that fly effectively with all four wings without attaching them together in some way. So I'll show you those attachments in later orders. But if you ever see a video of odonata flying, you're going to see these wings moving in and of their own accord. The dragonflies have very large compound eyes that meet dorsally on the surface of their heads. So you see these dorsal touching of these large, large compound eyes found in the dragonflies. <clears throat> this is an indication of their predatory nature, right? They use these really large eyes to help them find their prey. The naiads of the dragonflies are very large. They're wide bodied look like this here and they have rectal gills so gills that are held internally inside the rectum or inside that last abdominal segment of the body damselflies on the other hand they're much more um, smaller they're much more slender and and tinier than the dragonflies they also have two pairs of wings but those wings are almost exactly the same size they're narrow at the base where they meet the thoracic region. So you can see that narrowing there at the base. And when they are at rest, they're going to hold their wings vertically over their thorax instead of horizontally. So they hold them up. You can kind of see it in this picture here. You see them holding that up that way. Okay, so up here, you see a much better picture. They're up instead of vertical, like here, like the dragonflies. So up for the damselflies, horizontal for the dragonflies. They also, the, the damselflies also have large compound eyes and they have three acelli, but the compound eyes are separated dorsally. So they have these big wide spaces in between the compound eyes. So they're almost on the either side of the head as opposed to touching at the top or touching in the dorsal surface or at the apex, the vertex of the head. The naiads are slender bodied. So they sort of mimic that more slender version of the damselfly, and they have these three caudal appendages, these three terminal leaf-like gills that protrude from the tip of the abdomen. So you can tell the damselflies from the dragonflies even, even in that naiad form. Now, damselflies and dragonflies, they are found all over the world. Uh, they both need fresh water to breed, but the adults can fly many, many miles away from that fresh water in order to find food or to find mates or to try to take over new territory. The males tend to be territorial. They will stay close to their territory, their claimed area of water. And they're going to guard that hunting ground and that mating ground. You can often observe males just sort of perched on a favorite vantage point. This is usually a branch or a rock, or they might fly rapidly around their territory. If another male or an enemy enters that territory, the males, uh, the dragonflies especially, are going to fly very rapidly after that intruder and then return back to their same perch. The females of both groups often roam much further from the water in search of prey. So these are those dragonflies and those damselflies that you see flying over dry meadows or dry areas of campus, places where you don't see a lot of water and you're wondering why they're there. What they're doing is they're hunting. They're chasing after insects. So they go really far in order to find this stuff, while the males tend to stay around their little water area and, and protect it so they don't lose their hunting grounds and their mating grounds. Now, dragonflies in general are often powerful, active, searching predators. They use those really large eyes and their quick flying abilities to find and capture their prey. Damselflies are frail. They sit and wait. So they're the sit and wait type of predators. They're going to wait until prey comes into range, and then they're going to dart after that prey in order to catch it. Mating in this group involves the transfer of sperm to a sperm reservoir or to secondary genitalia. Mating usually takes place what we call on the wing. So the male is going to hold the female in a wheel type position and the female is going to bend over and collect the sperm. They do part of this while they are flying. 
the male is going to employ various strategies to improve his chances of reproduction. We looked at some of this when we looked at the internal anatomy of the insects, right? So they'll do some weird things since the females have the opportunity to mate numerous times before they actually allow for fertilization of their eggs. So the male is going to do things like removal of sperm of the other males, uh, maybe displacement of that sperm. They might uh, have multiple inseminations of a single female. They might flush uh, competitive sperm from that genital cavity of the female. Once the male is at least partially sure that the female is using his sperm in order to uh, fertilize those eggs, he's going to guard that female as she flies along to deposit her eggs. So eggs are deposited uh, freely either in the water or they're attached or inserted in submerged vegetation, just depending on the species, depending on the group. The resulting naiads spend almost their entire lifetime underwater. They can molt up to 15 times before they're ready to emerge. So the development time is dependent upon the species and where they live. So for most species, development can take one to two years, but there are some species that live in temporary bodies of water where um, they will develop just within months. When a naiad is fully mature, the final instar is going to crawl out of the water onto overhanging rocks or vegetation, and they're un going to undergo a final molt where they, will where they will emerge as an adult. The adults generally just live for a few weeks. They're going to hunt and they're going to mate and then end up dying while those naiads live for a couple of years. The naiads are predators, so they employ what is called an ambush type of hunting method. They're going to sort of blend into their surroundings and they're going to wait for potential prey to stop by. The most common um, types of naiads will occur in running water or estuaries, and they're going to die off very quickly once that water becomes polluted. So this is another type of species that we can use uh, to indicate the presence or absence of uh, pollution in water. So the presence or absence of these naiads is an indicator of the health of streams and rivers. Now, I mentioned that uh, naiads are predators. These naiads have modified mouth parts that'll help them in their predatory nature. They have all the basics of the mandibulate mouth parts. So they've got that labium, that labrum, the mandibles, the maxillae, and all those associated palps. <clears throat> but the labium, that lower lip is especially elongate. So it is really, really modified to allow for a certain type of predation. So the labium, extremely elongate, and it has the distal margins of the labial palpi um, that form deep asymmetrical dentations, or teeth. The palpi fit together when the labium is retracted, forming what we call a mask over the lower part of the head. So you can see in this drawing here, here you've got this labium retracted underneath that thoracic region. Okay, here are the palps that are nice and fat and elongate and it fits together. Here's a front version of it. You can almost see those teeth right there. So these are the palps, labial palps. This is the rest of the labium, okay? And it folds back underneath. So it covers the rest of those mouth parts in a mask-like form. So it's called a mask. Mm -mm. Now, the labium works kind of like a, um, a shovel. It's going to reach out and grab the prey using those labial palps and bring it back into the rest of the mouth parts. It works on a, on a hydraulic type of system. The nymph will actually clench its anus and it's going to contract its thoracic and abdominal muscles. This is going to increase the pressure within the hemocell. This increased pressure causes the labium to shoot outwards and the labial palpi to open up. Prey is actually harpooned on the dentitions or on spikes on the palpi, and it's pulled back to the mandibles for feeding. So the shape of this, uh, this labium, the shape of the dentitions and the palpi are extremely important when it comes to uh, identification of these different uh, species. All right, so let's watch this video over here of this um, Naiad feeding. So here it is slow. Watch as that labium comes out 
and those those labial palps open up to try to grasp these mosquito larvae. So see, it'll grasp it. This particular species has these little points on the end of those palps. Mosquito larvae, rawr, eat it. So here it is breathing through its um, anal gills. So if you remember what we just talked about, those gills that are held internally means that this is a dragonfly larvae. And these larvae are so voracious, they will even attack fish. So watch it go. Reaching out, grabbing these small fish, and pulling that back to feed on it. So this is crazy. Voracious, voracious predators feeding on these fish. Watch it again. <laughs> Rawr. Look how fast that labium comes out. It is really quick. This can allow it to be this type of predator. Look at those labial palps opening up. Man. And these predators will go for things much larger than themselves. And some of the time, they'll be really successful, grabbing these larger uh, animals and feeding on them. Dragonfly nymphs are ferocious and voracious predators, catching anything that moves with their projectile lower jaw, which they extend at supersonic speed. They are the terror of the ponds. Adult dragonflies are also active hunters that catch all kinds of insects on the wing including their own species. While flying adult dragonflies have a lifespan of between 8 and 60 days, some species may spend the first six years of their lives underwater as nymphs. Fierce dragonfly nymphs detect their victims by movement. When close enough, they shoot out their retractable lower jaw in an explosive and accurate attack. Feeding voraciously on all types of larvae, tadpoles and aquatic insects, they can reach up to 5 centimeters, shedding and regrowing their exoskeleton more than 15 times before emerging from the surface to become a flying insect. These efficient predators help control the populations of other land and aquatic insects whose incubation period takes place in water. All right, so those were the dragonflies and the damselflies. Up next, we're going to start getting into some newer, more evolved, less ancient groups. Let me know if you have any questions.